previously on Ahsoka. Hera Syndulla is facing trial for disobeying the New Republic and not stopping Ahsoka Tano. She was right, though, because all she did was ignore one guy, and so off-screen Leia Organa commanded the Council to set her free. Ezra and Sabine are chilling while the rock people move around, and the enemies find them. The Poodle, the angry aliens and Thrawn's reinforcements fight them. Balon doesn't go, though. He decides to do something else, I guess. Elsewhere, the space whales took Ahsoka to the exact galaxy solar system and planet she needed to be. She arrived at the action after easily bypassing a minefield, massive lasers and enemy fighters. And once Ahsoka descends into the planet, she jumps to the surface and somehow landed just fine right next to Balon. As they fight, Wuyang shoots at them to create a distraction for Ahsoka to escape. If you're wondering how these explosions didn't hurt anyone, it's because these are leftover fireworks from a Power Rangers set. Finally, Ahsoka uses teleportation to meet Sabine and Ezra and defeat the enemy. Then, they let the portal go, despite Ahsoka trying to murder her master a few minutes ago. Thrawn failed to capture any of them multiple times, but he still says this is part of his plan, because he gained the time he needed to load things into the cargo hold and escape. On to the grand finale. But first, how stupid is Thrawn? Disney Lucasfilm introduced Thrawn in the second season of the animated show Rebels. He stepped in to stop the Ghosh crew, a group of proto-rebels looking to liberate Ezra's home planet, Lothal, from the Empire. The show's protagonist, Ezra, defeated Thrawn in the final battle. He used the Force to command these space whales, the Purgils, to take Thrawn's ship to another galaxy, while Ezra and Thrawn were on the ship. That is where we find Thrawn and Ezra on this show, on another planet in another galaxy. It means the whales took them there safely and then, somehow, Ezra escaped and started a new hippie life on the unknown planet. Let's pause for a moment. This ship, this burning, broken ship that traveled to another galaxy on the Rebel season finale, doesn't even have a front glass panel. Why does everyone assume they are alive? Would you travel in a car without a front glass panel? Am I crazy for expecting a little bit of sense? Anyway, in episode 6, we learn that Thrawn has information and even a tracker to find Ezra, but he never did. Ezra defeated the Grand Admiral when he was just a kid, so I think he should have put in a little bit more effort. After all, Sabine found Ezra just chilling on a camp about half an hour away from Thrawn's ship. And how easy it would have been to settle on another planet or even another part of the same planet and leave Ezra stranded forever. Imagine if he had sent Sabine to look for Ezra, but Ezra is lost somewhere beyond an ocean. Oh no! We also learned that his plan to find Ezra was not using his ship, gunships, troopers or information to find him. It was to send his best fighting assets, Balon and the Poodle, to track Sabine and ultimately kill her and Ezra. So he was sure Sabine would be able to find the Why? Jedi. Why didn't he do it then? Moreover, he knows there's a Jedi somewhere on the planet, and yet he sends away the only Dark Force user he knows, and he plans to betray him. You are really Episode 7 gets even worse. We learn that the space witches can track Jedi, but he never uses them to track Ezra. Rather, he uses them to track Ahsoka's ship and then proceeds to send a couple of fighters after her. He also decides to send two gunships full of troopers against Ezra and Sabine, knowing full well that Ezra is a capable fighter, and after disregard the witch's advice of keeping Sabine in prison. He has a Star Destroyer, he could fly it, go to Ezra and shoot, or he could order Esbeth's ship to explode Ezra's location. Finally, after his enemies meet on the battlefield, Thrawn's decision is to load the Star Destroyer's cargo and flee. I always thought that the plan was going back to the original galaxy in Esbeth's ship, because the Star Destroyer can do intergalactic travel, but there he is, wasting all of this time while his enemies gather and plan to take him down. Moreover, I know he's been loading the ship since episode 6, which was weird to see because the ship appeared on the planet so I guess it was already loaded. Moreover, this planet is empty so what could they be getting here? Rocks? And he's been stranded for years, he could have done this any other time. I guess Thrawn is a last minute kind of genius admiral. So on a scale from 1 to 10, Thrawn is 11 for full return. Now let's talk about episode 8. We're back in Thrawn's ship. The troopers finished loading blood holes into the cargo hold. Thrawn commands them to bring down the Halo ship to begin the interlocking process. The trooper replies by saying they know Ahsoka's location. The genius admiral decides to take care of the situation by sending, get this, two 
TIE Fighters. He then lectures Morgan about never underestimating the enemy, much less the Jedi. Two TIE Fighters are an overkill at this point. Next, the Space Witches accept Morgan into their cult in a long and boring scene. They gift her the Blade of Talsin. Talsin was the Night Sisters' leader, a recurring villain in the Clone Wars animated show. But if you didn't see the show, this is just a random easter egg. Elsewhere, Ahsoka's ship is flying above the rock people. Why are they there? Aren't they supposed to stop Tron? Isn't their presence there putting the innocent rock people at risk? Where are they going? So many questions, so little answers. The hero's crew is preparing to fight Tron and set the stage for a movie that may or may not come. Before that, though, Ezra notices that something is amiss between Ahsoka and Sabine. Hu Yang explains that Ahsoka was afraid Sabine began training as a Jedi to avenge the fall of Mandalore. Ahsoka felt Sabine could become dangerous as a Dark Force user. I guess this will be enough to explain why Sabine becomes so powerful. And right now, Ahsoka is ready to forgive her for everything. Rather than being mad with Sabine for following the craziest plan ever, she congratulates her. No lessons learned, even if Ahsoka resolved the situation by pure luck. It's at least on par with Ahsoka's character. She wants to be there for Sabine as much as Anakin was there for her. And because there's an unresolved sexual tension between them. Give me the meat and give it to me raw. In fact, Ahsoka is so unwilling to teach her anything or reprimand her for anything that she forgot how Sabine betrayed her on episode 4. After Ahsoka fell to the ocean, rather than trying to help her, Sabine immediately joined the enemy. And now they don't even talk about it, just as no one mentioned Sabine's wound again. A blood hole not mentioned means everything makes sense. Character evolution not done through words or actions means the character evolved off screen. But oh no, two TIE fighters hit the ship, because these are the only TIE fighters with accuracy in the entire Star Wars universe. Ahsoka and Ezra are pushing the ship up with the force, and Sabine jump starts it. She then rams the two TIE fighters with its wings, and the ship crashes down. Do you know why the TIE fighters had a courtesy because they were at point blank. Anyway, Sabine walks away with her cool face. Cool girls don't look at explosions. Ahsoka is equally cool and she doesn't lose her temper. Thrawn is satisfied with the result and decides to prepare the troopers to defend the base. Because troopers have successfully defeated Jedi's in the past, right? Troopers wearing a scrappy armor will do even better against not one but two and a half Jedi's. Why not send all of the TIE fighters and blow their ship and all of them together though? I guess I'm not a genius as Thrawn. By the way, Ezra was definitely very close to Thrawn because they reached the ship in the next scene in the CGI dock. Ahsoka is so cool that she decides to take the front door. Sabine is so cool that she's riding the dock. The heroes are riding directly below the Star Destroyer as the massive ship flies up as slowly as possible. And as it rises, it misses all of the 10 shots it takes because, you see, they need to be at point blank. So the heroes reach the tower, holding the ship in the sky. Tron looks distraught. It's only now that he realizes how stupid he's been. He dispatches more troopers and cries for help to the witches. Please! Please! So as the Jedi's defeat the troopers, the space witches resurrect them with magic, with a K at the end, because this is a thing now in Star Wars. They are now slower and more clumsy, but powerful enough to beat Ezra. Sabine is so cool though that she saves him. They keep fighting up the stairs while the Star Destroyer gets ready to go. Theron recognizes the Jedi are almost on board, so he requires more help from the witches. Somehow he knows Morgan can fight, even though they just met. The fight continues on the tower and the new fighting witch catches up to the Jedi's. Ahsoka decides to stay behind to deal with her. Morgan's actress Diana Lee Monsanto is a Jet Kune Do and Esgrima martial artist. Her actions look fluid and smooth, which only makes Rosario Dawson and the rest of the cast look even more silly and slow in comparison. Ezra and Sabine are fighting more soldiers at the top of the tower. Ezra gets beaten again. A soldier is holding Sabine against a pillar and grunts at her long enough for her to master the force, pull the lightsaber and kill him. Then she saves Ezra again. Cool. By the way, this monster had multiple chances to kill Ezra, but he did the classical PG-13 move, which is throw the enemy when he's beaten rather than <laughs> Tron's ship is slowly moving away from the tower. Troopers look down the hatch at Ezra and Sabine and decide not to shoot. Remember, never underestimate your opponent. But Sabine is so cool that she convinces Ezra to jump from the top of the tower to the ship. He jumps and it's not enough, but because Sabine just mastered the force, she force pushes him to the ship. Then she saves him again by sniping the trooper that was about to kill Ezra. How is Ezra going to manage surviving for 5 seconds without Sabine at this point? I guess she's not worrying about that because she decided to ditch him. Freeze! 
Ahsoka is now fighting at the top of the tower against Morgan and the zombies. Sabine, who just mastered the force and also lightsaber combat a few minutes ago, joins a fight and showcases perhaps the silliest action choreography in the franchise. Walk slash walk walk slash tiny kick. That's almost as good as the scene where Morgan breaks Ahsoka's sword. Let's see it. Morgan is holding the sword vertically with the left hand. This is no slashing position. Morgan's right hand is leaving the rest of her body right open. Then there's a flash, probably because the actresses missed their mark. The sword didn't hit where it needed to hit. After the flash, the scene is a blur, but we notice Morgan broke Ahsoka's sword by the hilt. How? Who knows? It feels like the action scenes they managed to film with a cast of out of shape actors suck, so they added makeup in post production. When is this going to end? Apparently soon. Ahsoka defeated Morgan. Then the girl powers decide to run to the edge of the tower and jump to escape. Now Thrawn remembers his ship has cannons and decides to shoot at the tower. The ship fails and the troopers behind Ahsoka and Sabine running in a straight line also fail. And guess what? Ahsoka and Sabine jump on top of their vessel. It's already fixed and it's apparently the stealthier ship in the two galaxies. Don't believe me? Well, this is an even bigger target and the Star Destroyer is still misses all of its shots. I guess they can't see it. Anyway, the Star Destroyer blows up the tower and kills their own troops. It's too late though, as Hu Yang approaches Tron's ship, the Grand Admiral jumps to hyperspace. Great work Sabine. They come back to the rock people, defeated Shin, I'm sorry the Poodle and Balen are somewhere on the planet doing something. Their character arcs inconclusive, and by the way, what an impressive amount of Jedi's after Order 66. The Star Destroyer is approaching Dathomir. Elsewhere, Ezra arrived at the Hera's ship disguised as a trooper. No mind on how he escaped or found the general. Rebel fans get a touching moment though. Ezra refers to Hera as mom in a scene of gloriously bland acting. Everyone else received nothing but questions. Who? In the final scene, Ahsoka congratulates Sabine for taking Ezra home. The Jedi is perfectly happy where she is which plays with the theme of episode 5, being tired of fighting. Finally, Anakin's forced force ghost appears. Satisfied, as Ahsoka finds the ultimate retirement spot, free of her Jedi responsibilities. Earlier in the episode, Ahsoka was lecturing Sabine about what it means to be a Jedi. I guess the answer is, if you fail and the enemies win and threaten everything you love, just relax bro. Peace earned by doing nothing is the same as peace earned by battle. Ahsoka episode 8 has more plot holes than Rey Skywalker has powers. The biggest one is, what was Thrawn loading into the ship, we never knew, and this is the reason why Thrawn took so long, and why the battle took place. The other major plot convenience I want to note is, when the space whales took Thrawn's broken, burning ship with no front glass panel to another galaxy, they dropped him off on an ancient Dathomir planet, exactly the place where he could get the help he needed to return. The whole setup for this show is idiotic. Thrawn, however, is the perfect token to explain what the show is. He's supposed to be a genius admiral, but he only won because of magic, and the heroes are only alive because the enemy was supremely incompetent, imagine that. Thrawn made every stupid decision he could while trying to sound imposing and competent. He is what hubris looks like, the result of an inept moron posing as a smart guy. Hubris, like Ahsoka's creator Dave Filoni. Filoni seems to think that the Star Wars universe is his little playground, a place he manipulates as he wishes to desperately defeat the characters that were never there and never mentioned. His desperate quest to insert his unique characters into the overall plot led him to create a bland, charmless, emotionless fetch quest, where the only result is characters essentially changing places. It felt more like a video game side quest line, an endless fetch where characters don't learn or grow, they simply level up their fighting power. So it's no surprise that Filoni wasn't even capable of following the main role he created for this limited series, which is that Sabine had no potential. Not bad. But not good. But she still became a full Jedi Knight by the end. She did not learn how to emote though, because Sabine, Ezra and Ahsoka could very well be animated characters, Mass Effect Andromeda or Starfield animated characters. This happens because these characters are empty, Ezra is barely there, he doesn't react, question or ponder. Sabine is a hot-headed mess who still gets everything right and everyone loves her. Ahsoka, and Ahsoka the White, is super stoic and cool from beginning to end, and there's nothing more to say about her. Then there's Hera, a pointless character with no purpose other than being a terrible general, and the rest of the New Republic Council and army, whose existence is there to justify why the First Order will rise.
And Dave, no amount of references to the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy would make your show look better. This show, this brain forsaken disaster, is an irredeemable mess by a fool at the height of his ego. But hey, at least the show won the Seal of Female Empowerment in Entertainment Award for Female Representation. The all female Sophie panel gave Ahsoka a 10 out of 10 for the show passing the Bechtel test, a parody measure evaluating female empowerment by the amount of women on a show that have a conversation with other other women that are not about men. I guess the main goal was completed. And do you know what's ironic? The best character in the show by far is Balan Skull. He had a menacing presence, physical prowess, conflicting ideas, an interesting character arc, and a superb delivery of his lines. It's a shame that the actor passed away. Finally, to all of the Star Wars fans screaming at every little cameo and easter egg, I say, what you get in life will rarely be any better than what you expect. Cheating, endlessly, only fits the corporate machine to create more brain-dead content. A smile and you'd be like Ezra, happy and satisfied to come back home even though the enemy won and his friends are lost in another galaxy. Although I wonder if these fans are enough anymore. Disney closed their Galactic Cruiser Hotel on the day Ahsoka's finale was released. The show fell on the Nielsen charts down to number 7 top watch original shows under Only Murders in the Building, a show by Disney's little sibling streaming platform Hulu and Hasbro is apparently not doing any Ahsoka toys. That's it friends, I'll move on to other shows. What would you like me to talk about friends? Loki, 2023's Robin Hood? Let me know. Subscribe, comment and hit the like button if you like what you saw. Give the comment section. Civilized.